Uh, happy Constitution Day, everybody. We're actually celebrating three birthdays today. Uh, if you don't know why today is Constitution Day, it's because the Philadelphia Convention that wrote the Constitution ended its work on September 17th, 1787, so that's 230 years ago today. Uh, Justice David Souter, retired Justice David Souter, uh, fittingly enough, was born on Constitution Day. He turns 80 today. And most importantly, of course, my youngest daughter, Tamora, who's off to college this year, turns 19. Uh, she gratefully accepts all your good wishes. Uh, I'm going to do five things in my presentation. Uh, for those of you who are in Con History 1 now, I warn you there is significant overlap. Uh, first, I'm going to briefly describe the flaws in the Articles of Confederation that played a significant role leading to the Constitution. Second, I'm going to describe fights that were going on in the states over monetary and fiscal policy, which also significantly contributed to the writing of the Constitution. Third, I'm going to describe two different facets of the Constitution, its nationalism and its anti-populism, uh, which made the Constitution something different from what I think most Americans were anticipating and probably wanting out of the Philadelphia Convention. Fourth, I'm going to try to explain how the delegates in Philadelphia managed to do this thing, which was a surprise to the country. And then fifth, and maybe in some ways most interestingly, how in the world did they get the country to ratify something that was so different from what the country wanted and expected. Hopefully, we'll have time for a few questions at the end. If not, if anyone has pressing questions, feel free to email me, uh, or I can probably stay for a few minutes after the talk. All right, first, to a certain extent, the Constitution is a response to flaws in the Articles of Confederation. What were those flaws? First of all, Congress had no power to raise taxes. It had no independent rev revenue-raising capacity under the Articles. It could request money, they called that requisitions, but it had no coercive authority to go after states if, or uh, colonies and states if they failed to satisfy their requisitions. Uh, you really wouldn't want Congress to have to go after states in any event because to coerce a state might require going to war against it, whereas with t taxing individuals, you can throw individuals in jail if they don't cough up their taxes. The second obvious power that Congress lacked was the power to regulate foreign and interstate commerce. Foreign nations would discriminate against American trade in the years after the Revolutionary War, and the United States had no ability to retaliate. For example, after the Revolutionary War ended, Great Britain barred Americans from the, uh, the lucrative transatlantic carrying trade, and they also excluded goods from the uh, British Empire that could be found elsewhere within the empire. So no American codfish from New England if they could get cod from Newfoundland, their colony, instead. Uh, individual states might try to respond. Congress didn't have the power to respond. Individual states might decide to impose tariffs on British goods in retaliation, but that created a massive collective action problem. If New York imposed tariffs on British good, goods, that created an incentive for neighboring Delaware and New Jersey to make themselves into free ports. Congress also lacked the power to regulate interstate commerce, and that also posed a significant problem. New York had the best natural harbor in the country, and that way it was able to impose taxes that were borne by consumers in neighboring Connecticut and New Jersey. Those states then responded. They didn't like subsidizing New York state government. They responded by throwing up barriers to trade with New York or even threatening not to pay their federal requisitions. All right, so those are two principal substantive powers that Congress lacked that we assume Congress naturally should exercise, power to tax, power to regulate commerce. Even in areas where Congress expressly had important powers, like the power to make treaties, it lacked an enforcement mechanism in practice. So to illustrate that problem, Congress entered into a treaty with Great Britain to end the Revolutionary War. One of the articles in that treaty provided that states should not throw up impediments to the recovery by creditors of pre-war debts. Particular states did not like that policy, did not like that provision in the treaty, namely Virginia, to some extent Maryland, so they would decide to pass laws that were inconsistent with the treaty. In theory, states were probably bound to defer to the treaty negotiated by the Confederation Congress, but in practice, there was nothing Congress could do to force them to comply. 
As George Washington told the Foreign Secretary John Jay, quote, if you told the state legislatures they had violated the Treaty of Peace and invaded the prerogatives of the Confederacy, they would laugh in your face. If the United States violated its treaty obligations, obviously the British would reciprocate by violating the undertakings they had made in the treaty, for example, to evacu evacuate forts along the northwestern frontier of the United States. So no effective practical mechanism for enforcing federal supremacy. The articles were flawed. Most people appreciated the flaws. They proved impossible in practice. Uh, efforts to provide Congress with those powers that were lacking could never secure the unanimity requirement that existed for securing amendments under the Articles. Now that's half the story of what was driving constitutional reform in 1787. The other half involves what was going on in the states. So this is the second part of my talk. The United States was facing a severe economic contraction in the years after the Revolutionary War. Uh, most modern historians seem to regard it as the worst economic conditions in American history other than the Great Depression of the 1930s. There were several causes. One was the usual post-war recession that is a result of dramatically reduced demand in the, com in the economy. You had these two huge armies, which governments were supporting with clothing, uniform, food, horses. Now suddenly that demand was no longer there. The war also destroyed vast amounts of productive land. In addition, tens of thousands of slaves had escaped from South Carolina and Georgia, especially escaping to the British, where they got their freedom, but in the process wiping out vast immense amounts of Southern wealth. And the British also, as I've said, shut Americans out of the transatlantic carrying trade after the war, and that had been critical to the American economy. Now, at the same time the economy was slumping, states were imposing heavy taxes because they were trying to finance their war debt, and they were trying to pay congressional requisitions, which also went toward financing the war debt. Most modern economists would tell you, of course, that is a disastrous physical, fiscal policy, the government raising taxes during a time of severe economic contraction. In addition, the taxes that were imposed often were required to be paid in gold and silver, and the amount of that circulating was down to perhaps only 20% of what it had been before the war. Some of it was financing a uh, trading deficit with Great Britain. There was a spending spree by American consumers after the war ended. Some of it was simply sent out of the country for greater security against the possibility that paper money would be issued by state legislatures and people would be forced to take it at depreciated values. Last point in this regard, the war debt, soldiers' pay certificates, for example, was increasingly being concentrated in the hands of a smaller and smaller number of speculators who had bought it at a fraction of par value and were now demanding higher taxes and more rigorous collection so that their bonds would be paid off. They would make a financial killing because they had often bought that debt or 10 or 15 cents on the dollar, and now it would be paid off if their demands were realized at face value. Farmers didn't necessarily agree that they ought to be paying higher taxes so that speculators reaped a windfall. Tens of thousands of farmers, and most Americans were farmers at the time, were unable to pay their taxes, and they faced the possibility of farm foreclosures. Uh, they naturally turned to politicians for relief, and because the United States had the broadest suffrage rights in the world, most farmers could vote, and most state constitutions had created governments that were very responsive to public opinion. Annual elections, small constituencies, weak governors that had relatively little authority to check legislatures. The result was a majority of states passed the relief measures in some form that farmers were demanding, paper money emissions and debtor relief laws. Now, paper money laws usually took the form of land banks. Essentially, what was happening was the government was lending money to farmers who would have to pay it out back over a certain number of years with their land as collateral, paying something like 6% interest. It wasn't just issuing paper money, it was loaning money through a public, loaning money through a public land bank. 
This essentially allowed farmers to monetize the wealth in their land so they could pay their taxes, pay their debts without going bankrupt. A debtor relief law, for example, would say to a debtor, you can pay your debt back in installments, you can pay it back uh, on a more relaxed schedule over a longer period of time, you can pay it back in uh, kind and property rather than in cash. Ordinary and elite Americans frequently had very different views of this relief legislation. I've already given you, I think, the perspective of the debtor farmers. This is a sensible relaxation of monetary and fiscal policy in a time of severe economic contraction to prevent needless farm foreclosures and prevent speculators from making a financial killing. The nation's elite had a rather different view. People like Washington and Madison, Alexander Hamilton, they thought these sorts of laws were both contrary to natural right and terrible policy. Contrary to natural right in the sense that they thought the point of establishing government was to protect property, not to redistribute it, and the tax and debt relief simply rewarded the lazy and dissolute when what they really needed were incentives to just work a little bit harder so they could pay off their debts and their taxes. For example, one typical diatribe, this one comes from the governor of New Jersey, complained about the, quote, lazy, lounging, lubberly fellows who sat around drinking, working perhaps two days in the week, and receiving for that work double the wages they earned and spending the rest of their time in squandering those non-earnings in riot and debauch. The farmer who protested that he could not pay taxes was a man whose three daughters were under the discipline of a French dancing master when they ought every one of them to be at the spinning wheel, and while they should be dressed in decent homespun, as were their frugal grandmothers now carrying half of their father's crop upon their backs. Paper money from the perspective of the elite invariably depreciated in value. It redistributed property from creditors to debtors, and it deterred credit and investment. Why lend money in gold or silver if you're going to be paid back in depreciated paper? Madison, who's more responsible for the Constitution than anyone else, referred to, quote, the pestilent effects of paper money on the necessary confidence between man and man, on the necessary confidence in the public councils, on the industry and morals of the people, and on the character of Republican government. Now, in addition, and perhaps in some ways even more importantly, the elite diagnosed the political problem that had produced such legislation. State governments that were too responsive to mass public opinion Low property qualifications, annual elections, small legislative districts, weak executives who could not effectively check legislatures. One prominent Virginian, Richard Henry Lee, concluded that a departure, quote, from simple democracy was indispensably necessary. There are a few seats up here. Uh, five of you or so want to cross over here. I won't think it's rude, I promise. <laughs> Anybody else? People like leaning against the back? Yes, sir. Take advantage of the opportunity. All right, so we should note one other point related to what was going on in the states. Massachusetts, which had one of the least populous constitutions in the country, actually resisted demands for relief and resisted issuance of paper money. And it was, in fact, imposing heavier taxes in 1786 in response to a congressional requisition of the year before. That resulted in Shays' Rebellion, a famous event in Revolutionary War history. Shays' Rebellion was an effort by several thousand farmers in the central counties of Massachusetts to close the civil courts in order to prevent foreclosures and force the state legislature to pass some sort of relief measure. It was eventually suppressed by a militia force that had been financed by Eastern Massachusetts creditors who had a direct interest in collecting taxes that would pay off the government bonds that they themselves held. These sorts of developments scared some of the nation's elite into supporting the process of constitutional reform at the national level.
For, we, for example, we know George Washington was having serious doubts about whether to attend the Philadelphia Convention, which began in uh, May of 1787. It was pretty clearly reports of Shays' rebellion that finally convinced him the situation was growing desperate and he should go. He and Madison were receiving reports back in Virginia that the Shaysites were, quote, and these are dramatically exaggerated reports of what was actually happening, that the Shaysites were, quote, determined to annihilate all debts, public and private, and that anarchy with its horrid train of miseries seemed imminent. People who felt that affairs in the states were getting out of hand thought a stronger national government could be the solution, not simply the solution to the flaws in the articles, but a solution to what was going on in the states. The national government could bar the Constitution could bar paper money and debt relief issued by uh, laws passed by the states, and it could empower Congress to suppress debtor rebellions like Shays' Rebellion. And of course, the Constitution does both of those things. It bars paper money emissions, it bars making uh, retrospective changes in contracts, and it authorizes Congress to suppress rebellions. The national government could also be insulated from direct populist pressure by creating longer terms in office, large constituencies, indirect elections, and a more powerful executive. And that's exactly what they did. So now let me turn to the third part of my talk, what happened at the Philadelphia Convention. There were deep divisions in Philadelphia that nearly terminated the convention prematurely. Those were usually divisions between large states and small states over how to apportion representation in the legislature, and often debates between slave states and mostly free states over issues like how to apportion representation in the national legislature. But for our purposes, I want to emphasize the surprising amount of consensus on two separate issues how nationalist the Constitution is, and by nationalist I simply mean shifting power from the state and local level to the national level, and then second, how insulated that national government ought to be from direct populist political pressure. Now I want to illustrate these points, and then I'll move on to try to explain what I see as two puzzles, which are the fourth and fifth parts of the talk respectively. The first puzzle, part four, why was the convention so unrepresentative of national opinion that it wrote this nationalizing anti-populist constitution? And then finally, fifth, and I think most interestingly, how in the world did they get the country to approve a constitution, part of, which, part of the purpose of which was to constrain ordinary citizens from exercising influence over the national government? Okay, so in terms of nationalism, this is part 3A for those of you who are keeping score at home. Part 3A. Constitution gives the national government virtually unlimited power of taxation. That's a vast shift from the Articles where Congress only had power to requisition, i.e. beg for money. Now Congress can impose essentially any sort of taxation, not just the power over import duties, which had been uh, suggested as an amendment to the Articles, but was never approved by 13 states, now Congress can impose direct taxes like land taxes and head taxes, the sort of taxes that requires an internal revenue collector to go knocking on your door, the sort of tax that will result in your farm being foreclosed upon if you can't pay it. Second, the Constitution gives Congress virtually unlimited military power. Congress can raise an army, Congress can create a navy, Congress without limitation can call state militias into federal service. There are no limits about only an army during wartime. Congress can create a peacetime army. It's not limited in numbers. It's not in limited in duration. It's not limited by requiring supermajority requirements in Congress to approve a standing army. Contrast that with the Articles. Congress could requisition troops in the same way it could requisition money, but it didn't have any coercive authority in terms of raising military forces. Third, the Constitution gives Congress unlimited authority to regulate foreign and interstate commerce. There was no such power under the Articles, as I've already noted. Fourth, Congress has implied powers under the Constitution. 
Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18, after a whole bunch of specific powers are enumerated, says Congress, in addition, has the power to pass laws that are necessary and proper to implementing enumerated powers. That is an explicit grant of implied powers, unlike the Articles, which explicitly limited Congress to expressly delegated powers. That provision was intensely controversial during the ratifying contest. It was unanimously agreed to at the Philadelphia Convention. Fifth and finally, the Constitution supplies a mechanism for enforcing federal supremacy, right, to effectively make Congress's will coercive in the states in an area where Congress has explicitly granted power, like the power to make treaties. Madison had proposed one specific mechanism for enforcing federal supremacy. That was a national veto. Under Madison's plan, Congress could veto any law adopted by a state legislature. Nothing remotely like that had ever been publicly proposed before. It was too nationalist for even this nationalist group of delegates. And instead, they came up with a substituted, a substitute that was a combination of three different provisions. First, the Supremacy Clause, which explicitly declares federal law is supreme over state law to the contrary. Second, they created federal courts. The Constitution mandates a U.S. Supreme Court, and it authorizes but does not compel Congress to create lower federal courts, which Congress did immediately in the 1789 Judiciary Act. There were no federal courts of general jurisdiction under the Articles of Confederation. Third, Article I, Section 10 supplies a substantive rule of law. States may not pass debt or relief or paper money laws. Federal courts under the Supremacy Clause will strike down state laws that interfere with Article I, Section 10. Now, a majority of states had passed such laws, paper money laws and debtor relief laws, in the two or three years before the Philadelphia Convention in an effort to save tens of thousands of farmers from foreclosures. These provisions were unanimously embraced by the Philadelphia Convention even though a majority of states had just passed laws that were being forbidden by those provisions quite recently. All right, now I'm going to turn to the democracy constraining features of the Constitution, Part 3B. Article 1, Section 10 is both. It's both nationalizing, it's supplying a substantive rule that binds the states, but it's also anti-populist because it's responding to the populist economic relief legislation of the 1780s. So in addition to that, what were the populism constraining features of the Constitution? First were the long terms in office compared with the Articles of Confederation, compared with state constitutions where the norm was one year terms in office. That was the rule for almost every lower house of a state legislature. It was the rule for a majority of governors. It was the rule for representatives in Congress under the Articles. As you know, under the Constitution, representatives get two years, presidents get four years, senators get six years. There was no state office holder in the country, except maybe some judges who had six-year terms in office. What's especially striking is how many of the delegates actually wanted to go further. They had provisionally agreed on three-year terms for representatives. They had provisionally agreed on a seven-year term for the president. Many delegates favored much longer terms for senators. For example, Madison favored nine-year terms for senators. Many of the delegates actually favored lifetime tenure for presidents. Four state delegations, not delegates, delegations favored lifetime tenure for presidents. Alexander Hamilton favored lifetime tenure both for senators and presidents because he thought only lifetime tenure would sufficiently guarantee property rights in a representative form of government where the majority might be inclined to redistribute wealth in its own direction. Second, the framers adopted indirect election for senators and presidents. Senators, as you may know, were elected by state legislatures all the way until the uh, 17th Amendment was adopted in 1913. Presidents were and still are picked by electors 
who are chosen in a method selected by state legislatures, which could be popular vote or could be direct selection by the state legislature. And even today, according to the Tenth Circuit, the Constitution requires that these electors be allowed to exercise independent judgment. Why did they do that? Well, the framers did not trust the people to choose most of their elected officials. At the Philadelphia Convention, George Mason, who was a prominent Virginian, observed in response to a suggestion that the president be directly elected by the people, quote, it would be as unnatural for, to refer the choice of a proper character for chief justice to the people as it would be to refer a trial of colors to a blind man. Now, some of you are going to run for office one day. I want to offer you some helpful advice. The people who are going to vote for you, you probably shouldn't tell them they're too stupid and ignorant to have a say in who, get, who they get to elect to office. Right? The framers said that, George Mason said that behind the closed doors of the Philadelphia Convention with no reporters present. Third, the framers insulated even the House of Representatives, which is obviously a more populous institution with direct election every two years. Even the House, they tried to insulate as much as they could from direct populist influence. They created a very small House, first of all, which meant that individual congressional representatives would represent very large numbers of people over very large geographic areas. The point of that was twofold. They thought, first of all, that the larger the constituency, the larger the physical district, the more likely you would get the quote unquote better sort, the well-educated, well-born, wealthy elite elected to office. And they also thought the larger the district, the larger the constituency, the more slack there would be in the relationship between a representative and that representative's constituents, which would enable the representatives, in Madison's words, to refine and enlarge, in the words of critics, to ignore the will of constituents. So the original Congress is set by the Constitution at 65 members. Compare that as a useful baseline to the lower house of the Massachusetts legislature, which had at least 250, maybe closer to 300 representatives. 65 for the entire nation, 250, 300 just for the state of Massachusetts. In addition, the Constitution authorizes Congress through its Article I, Section 4 power to, to revise state regulations of the time, place, and manner of congressional regulations. It enables Congress to require the congressmen be selected at large. Now, that was a mouthful. What they meant essentially was Virginia gets 10 representatives in the first Congress. Congress could pass a law saying those representatives are to be selected by the entire body of Virginia citizens. So for example, rather than districting the state into 10 districts, you would give everybody 10 votes and a list of candidates, and then the top 10 on the list who would be elected by all Virginians would go to Congress. That would ensure, again, very large constituencies, an enormous geographic area, which would result both in the better sort being more likely to be elected and greater slack that would enable representatives to refine and enlarge slash ignore the will of their constituents. Last point, Constitution omits instruction, recall, and mandatory rotation in office. Those existed under the Articles in some form and in many state constitutions. So let me very briefly explain those. Instruction means constituents can instruct their representatives how to vote on a particular issue. For example, a Massachusetts town meeting would say to its representative in the legislature, we want you to vote against a proposed tax increase. We want you to vote in favor of declaring independence from Great Britain. The representative would then be at least morally bound, perhaps even legally bound, to do as the constituents instructed. Recall means that even during your elected term in office, you can be recalled by the voters. 
So representatives in Congress under the Articles were selected by state legislatures but could be recalled if the state legislature didn't like what they were doing. And finally, mandatory rotation is just term limits, the idea being you don't want your representatives getting used to be in power, getting entrenched in power. You think it's a useful thing for them to be rotated back into the status of mere constituents. They remember what it's like to be governed rather than doing the governing. The purpose of the provisions I just mentioned, right, the addition of the democracy constraining provisions, long terms in direct elections, and the omission of the democracy enhancing provisions, instruction recall mandatory, had a very clear purpose. The purpose was to ensure the federal government would never acquiesce to the sort of debt or relief legislation that the states had been adopting and that the federal government might be able to squelch such legislation at the state level. Okay, part four, how did the convention to do, manage to do what it did? One leading contemporary critic of the Constitution made the following observation, which I think most people would concede was true. Quote, the democratic and aristocratic, aristocratic parts of the community were disproportionately represented in Philadelphia. The question is why? Now I'm gonna give you some speculation. I have five or six discrete points which I hope together provide an explanation. When I wrote this book on the founding that was published a couple years ago, I saw this as a contribution to the literature. There's a long, a long subscribed to interpretation that says the Constitution was a kind of conservative counter-revolution against the forces of democracy and redistribution that were accelerated by the Revolutionary War. I agree with that. I don't think I'm saying something new. That's been out there for a long time. But in parts four and part five, I'm trying to put a sharper edge on the interpretation by explaining this puzzle. How did they manage to write this thing and how did they get ma manage to convince people to approve it? So first discrete point, state legislatures selected the delegates to the Philadelphia Convention in almost every state. How did they choose? They seem mostly to have simply chosen their most eminent citizens. Their most eminent citizens will be the quote unquote better sort, the wealthy large landholders, the people with large reputations. Well, the elite is correlated with distrust of populist economic legislation and populist political power. So there's a bias, simply if you choose your most eminent citizens like George Washington, Patrick Henry, uh, Richard Henry Lee, if you choose those people, they're likely to not think very well of the populist legislation or the populist state constitutions. But also to get this sort of reputation, you're likely to have served either in the military during the Revolutionary War or and or in the Confederation Congress. A majority of delegates in Philadelphia had done both. They had fought in the Revolutionary War. They had served in the Confederation Congress. Those are both profoundly nationalizing experiences. You worked at the national level to advance the interests of your country. You fought in a war to create a nation. And not incidentally, during that war, many officers regarded the states as being as obstructive as the British Redcoats because the states were never coughing up money and men in the way that George Washington, for example, wanted them to. Second, opponents had no reason to mobilize against the nationalizing and anti-populist project because they had little reason to expect that from the Philadelphia Convention. It turns out that the agenda of the convention mostly existed in James Madison's head. That's because Madison was the only one systematically preparing for the convention, studying, analyzing ancient and modern constitutions, trying to diagnose the problems in those constitutions and propose a set of remedies. He coordinated the Virginia delegates so they showed up early in Philadelphia. There they coordinated with the Pennsylvania delegates. Pennsylvania is the second largest state. Virginia is by far the largest state. Those two large state delegations coordinate on a plan that mostly emanated from Madison's research. And that plan, it turns out, is very nationalizing and anti-populist. Third, some delegates who have been appointed by their legislatures, about eight or ten of them, and here we're talking about people like Patrick Henry of Virginia, Richard Henry Lee of Virginia, also Samuel Chase of Maryland, People who would become leading critics of the Constitution were appointed by their legislatures but chose not to go 
to Philadelphia. Now, some of them gave reasons, some of them didn't. It's not clear we ought to necessarily credit the reasons they gave. It's a small sample size, eight or 10, so I don't want to generalize too much. But I would simply offer the speculation that these people had little reason to go to Philadelphia if the agenda was a mildly nationalizing one, which is what they suspected it would be, when you would give Congress the power to impose import duties or the power to regulate foreign and interstate commerce. They weren't that interested in that agenda. Had they known what Madison really had in mind, which was to scrap the articles from day one, to reconstitute the Confederation into a nation and so forth and so on, that's an agenda that they might have been pretty interested in going to resist. But they had no idea that the Philadelphia Convention was going to do that. Fourth, there were delegates who went to the convention, did not favor the nationalizing and anti-populist direction the convention was trending in, and decided to leave early as a way of indicating that they thought the whole enterprise was illegitimate. That's John Lansing and Robert Yates of New York, Luther Martin of Maryland. They made a choice, and it's a controversial choice, but it's not a crazy choice. They thought what the convention was doing was illegitimate. The convention had a set of limiting instructions. They scrapped those instructions from day one. They had a debate on day two about whether they were going to create a federal government or a national government, and they decided to create a national government. So these delegates thought, rather than add legitimacy to the enterprise, I will walk out in protest. Now, the cost of doing that is you disable yourself from influencing the final outcome. You basically ensure it'll go even further in the direction that you oppose. Two more points. They made a critical decision to close the doors of the convention. They had some good reasons for doing so. Madison later reported, and I think this is probably right, that if they hadn't closed the doors of the convention, they probably would not have been able to write any constitution at all. However, one effect of closing the doors, mostly closing the doors means there are no newspaper reporters there who will write down what was being said. There are two important effects. One is you liberate the delegates to embrace extreme positions that the constraints of politics might have deterred them from otherwise taking. Right? The more nationalist and the more anti-democratic your speech is, the more it might hurt your political career. Right? Think about Alexander Hamilton giving this famous speech in which he embraces lifetime tenure of the president and the Senate. That one, even though there was a, an oath not to share outside the convention, that one got out and it hounded Hamilton for the rest of his life because it made him sound like a monarchist, which in a sense he really was, right? So this liberates them. This liberates them to take extreme positions and also, and maybe even more importantly, closing the convention doors denies their opponents four months to get started in mobilizing opposition. The convention meets from May 25 to September 17, and those are four months, which in an era of fairly primitive transportation and communication, the opponents could have been mobilizing, but they didn't know what had happened. Sixth and finally, the delegates made a momentous choice, which was to seize the moment. Madison and Washington were exchanging correspondence before the convention, and they were relieved, they were overjoyed to discover that they both agreed that they should not, per they should not pursue temporizing expedience. They should seek a radical reform that would produce what they thought was the best ideal form of government. Randolph, the governor of Virginia, Edmund Randolph, when he introduced the Virginia plan, which was mostly written by Madison, this is what Randolph said introducing the plan according to Madison's notes, which are our best record of what was said in Philadelphia. He said, quote, he, Randolph, would not as far as depended on him leave anything that seemed necessary undone. The present moment is favorable and is probably the last that will offer. So they decided to go, to bro go for broke, thinking this might be their last chance to reach the ideal form of government that they wanted. Part five, how did the Federalists persuade the country, the Federalists are the people who support the Constitution, the Anti-Federalists are the people who oppose it, how did they convince the country through a reasonably democratic process to approve a Constitution, a substantial part of which was addressed to cutting ordinary people out of influence over the national government. Now, one quick word of clarification. When I call it reasonably democratic, 
I obviously don't mean it in a modern sense. Women were not participating. Most African Americans were enslaved. They're not participating. You had to own property in every state to participate. Poor people are not participating. It's not very democratic from 2019 perspective. From the perspective of world history and the contemporary moment, this was the most democratic thing the world had ever seen. Hundreds of thousands of men are voting for about 1,200, 1,500 delegates who will express a verdict on whether a particular form of government, a new form of government, will be enacted. The puzzle is, how do you convince people to approve something, part of which is addressed toward cutting ordinary people out of a significant role in government? First point, which is not an explanation, but just a point of emphasis, this was really closely contested, and you shouldn't assume things had to turn out the way they did. Rhode Island initially rejected the Constitution. North Carolina initially rejected the Constitution. New Hampshire almost certainly would have rejected the Constitution if Federalists had not deftly adjourned the convention for a few months. If they had voted when they first met, they very likely would have voted no. In addition, the Federalists only won in South Carolina because of mal massive malapportionment. A majority of South Carolinians almost certainly opposed the Constitution. And the votes in three of the five largest states, Virginia was the largest state, Massachusetts was the third largest state, New York was the fifth largest state, the vote in those states was so close that it's obvious that this thing could have come out the other way. So Virginia voted 89 to 79 in favor, New York 30 to 27, and Massachusetts 187 to 168. If one or two of those largest states had voted against ratification, it's a little hard to imagine the Constitution working, even though it only requires ratification by nine states to put it into operation. All right, the Federalists had a number of advantages in the contest. It was not entirely a fair fight. First, I already mentioned the malapportionment in South Carolina where it was most extreme. In South Carolina, which was about 50 to 60% enslaved African Americans, in South Carolina, 20% of the white population along the seaboard chose 60% of the delegates to the convention. The Constitution became more and more unpopular as you move from east to west. So Easterners, who were 20% of the white population, chose a majority of the South Carolina Convention. Almost certainly, if you had had a referendum in South Carolina of all white voters, the Constitution would have been rejected, but there was so much malapportionment in the Convention that the Convention voted by a two-to-one majority in favor. Second, the press overwhelmingly favored ratification of the Constitution. 90% of Americans lived outside of cities, at least 90% in 1787, 88, but newspapers for obvious economic and logistical reasons were published overwhelmingly within cities where both their advertisers and subscribers overwhelmingly supported ratification of the Constitution. Anti-Federalists in many states had a hard time even getting their side heard in the newspapers. Adnis Burke, who was a leading anti-Federalist in South Carolina, complained that, quote, the whole weight and influence of the press was on the side of the Constitution. There were about 90 newspapers publishing in the country in 1787, 1788. Only 12 of them published any significant amount of anti-Federalist literature. Third. Several conventions were held in coastal cities where support for the Constitution was overwhelming across class lines. Now, this had an effect both inside and outside the conventions. We're talking about Charleston, South Carolina, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Boston, Massachusetts. Right? You could have had the conventions in Worcester instead of Boston. They could have been in Lancaster instead of Philadelphia, but many of them were held in these eastern cities. All of the conventions at the state level were open to the public, meaning that there was a gallery of hundreds in attendance, and they were not shy about making their opinions heard. So, for example, we have a contemporary account from Connecticut where the crowd was dominated by Federalists, where any time an anti-Federalist would get up to speak, they would whistle, they would hoot, they would stomp their feet in order to drown them out and express, express disrespect for their opinions. With, without the conventions, outside the conventions, for example, in South Carolina, the Charleston elite, 
the large slave-owning aristocracy that were literally the wealthiest men in the country and very strong supporters of the Constitution. They held open houses at night where you can be sure the local community would whisper into the ears of any undecided delegates how great the Constitution was. Fourth, Federalists had an advantage simply in the division of opinion along regional and geographic lines. People in cities supported the Constitution, but there weren't a lot of people in cities. People along the East Coast supported the Constitution. The further west you went and the further into the back country you went, the more there was opposition. In an era of very poor, by modern standards, communication and transportation, that means that even if an opinion in the country was, was pretty much split down the middle, Federalists would have a significant advantage because they could simply organize more quickly. Fifth, the better sort, the well-educated, the well-born, the well-spoken elite, overwhelmingly supported Constitution with the one major exception of Virginia where people on both sides of the debate were equally elite. That gave Federalists a significant oratorical advantage to the extent that there were any delegates at conventions who actually had their minds not made up in advance. Backwoods farmers generally could not quote Cicero uh, in the original Latin. They were often intimidated out of speaking by what they perceived as their social betters and their more oratorically gifted opponents. Thus, for example, at the Massachusetts ratifying convention, I love this because it so resonates with populist res resentment toward elites today, anti-federalist Amos Singletary, who's a very impressive guy and is saying this with sarcasm dripping from his voice, he complained of, quote, these lawyers and men of learning and moneyed men that talk so finely and gloss over matters so smoothly to make us poor, illiterate people swallow down the pill. All right, just a couple more points. I'm almost done. Six, the genius of Article 7 was a huge Federalist advantage. Nine states, according to Article 7 of the Constitution, can put the Constitution into operation, but they can only bind themselves. No state can bind anybody else. Now, the Articles had required unanimous consent by all 13 state legislatures. The Constitution shifts that to nine state popular ratifying conventions to be called by legislatures can put the Constitution into operation. Federalists simply made this up, contrary to everyone's expectations. The calls for the convention had assumed Congress would have to approve whatever was written, and then it would have to be approved by all 13 state legislatures. They just changed the rules and hoped they could get away with it. Now, notice how this switches the balance of power. You may say, you may be inclined to think, well, no state can be bound without its own consent. That's the same as requiring unanimity, but it's not. Under the Articles, think about the holdout power, the bargaining power of the last state necessary to approve an amendment. Under the Articles, there's a unanimity requirement. Once 12 states have ratified, the last state, which on one occasion was New York, now realizes that they can bargain with Congress and say, we want certain changes to the, to the amendment if you expect us to go along. Compare that with the bargaining power of the four last states to ratify the Constitution. By Article 7, once nine states approve, the Constitution's up and running. Now you're deciding whether to join a country, which is, in a sense, a new country. If you don't join, you will be cut out of federal military protection. You will be treated like a foreign nation whose trade is subject to discrimination. And you will be cut out of any important decision making by the first Congress, like deciding where the national capital should go and deciding whether there should be a Bill of Rights. In practice, once nine states have ratified, the last four states have no choice but to follow along. Federalists also benefited a slightly different point from important anti-federalist miscalculations in New York and Virginia, where the anti-federalists went along with late meeting conventions, apparently thinking that would give them more time to organize and it might give them their states more weight in the ratifying process if they came along toward a critical moment at the end. But what they actually did was make themselves irrelevant 
before New York and Virginia ratified, nine states had approved the Constitution, which exercised the kind of coercive effect on those state legislatures. Last important point, and then I'll just summarize in 30 seconds and quit. The Federalists managed to keep intermediate options off the table, forcing a choice between the obviously flawed articles and the much more nationalist and anti-populist constitution, which a lot of people thought was pretty significantly flawed, even though they agreed the constitution, sorry, the articles needed to be reformed. The two most likely ways to have gotten to a point in the middle of the spectrum would have been either ratification conditional on amendments being adopted before the constitution went into effect, or a second convention which could now debate everything that had been said across the country and try to arrive at a point closer to median opinion. Anti-Federalists made pretty good arguments for both of those procedural routes. The argument for antecedent amendments was you'd have to be a lunatic to sign a contract knowing that the opposing party could then change its terms afterwards and not know what those terms would be. Right? That's what a promise of future amendments was, and that's all that Federalists were agreeing to. The argument for a second convention was we had a first convention which ignored its instructions, operated in secret, did something very different from what most people expected. Now we've had a national debate. We've seen lots of criticisms. Let's elect new delegates who can now arrive at a median position closer to what Americans want. Federalists made legal arguments and they made practical arguments against each of those alternatives, but I don't think those were the real reason. The real reason that they resisted those proposals was that they were not interested in what most Americans wanted. They wanted the Constitution they had written in Philadelphia ratified, and they knew they could not duplicate the circumstances of the Philadelphia Convention at a second convention, because now the cat was out of the bag. In this regard, consider what Randolph proposed to Madison before the convention and Madison's reaction. Randolph said, this is about March or April of 1787 before the convention meets, Randolph says, whatever we propose substantively, we should submit it to the country in a form where people can pick and choose, take what you like, reject what you don't like. Madison was horrified by that suggestion, and he ridiculed the idea that ordinary Americans could possibly have informed, respectable views on something as important as this issue of constitution making. This is what Madison said to Jefferson late in 1787. Right, it was Randolph who had proposed this, but I like the quote to Jefferson better. Quote, in Virginia, where the mass of people have been so accustomed to be guided by their rulers on all new and intricate questions, the matter of whether to ratify the Constitution certainly surpasses the judgment of the greater part of them. Okay, again, great platform for you to run on one day when you run for office. The mass of the country is not possibly up to this question of how to govern themselves. All right, so to sum up, Constitution is much more nationalist and anti-populist than most Americans expected or probably desired. The framers took advantage of the element of surprise to get it drafted. They barely got the country to ratify it. They benefited from some advantageous circumstances, from some miscalculations by their adversaries, and from some old-fashioned luck, some of which they actually created for themselves. Whether you agree with what they did, and anti-federalists thought this was incredibly illegitimate and they raised alarms about it, whether you agree with it, whether you think it's legitimate or not, I think you have to admire their skill at what they did. They essentially executed a kind of coup against dominant public opinion. So uh, I don't know if we have time or not. If we have to be out of the room, I should probably just quit and I can talk outside. If we have the room, I could take a couple questions. What do you think? Uh, just one? Okay. Quick question? Two questions? Yeah. Uh, I have two questions. Um, one, like you said, uh, the French took behind the uh, People who need to go should go, but try to, try to be quiet. Well, the uh, so I'm just wondering, like, what are our historical sources of what was said there? Um, and two is, like you mentioned, the flaws in the, the Articles of Confederation. Um, I mean, being from, from Belgium, from Europe, I sometimes hear comparison of the current European Union to like the Articles of Confederation, yeah. where you need to get any change for change, etc. Like, how, how, what do you think is comparable? Uh, right. 
Yeah, good question. So what we know from the convention is from notes that were taken by participants. Madison's notes, notes are the most detailed, but uh, people have estimated that he couldn't have written more than about 10% of the words that were spoken. He obviously couldn't speak and take notes at the same time. So his own speeches, we have to rely on what he said he said. We don't actually know what he said. And Madison, you know, when he, he didn't, he, he took shorthand notes and then each week he would go and try to turn them into something more elaborate. But sometimes by the end of the week, he couldn't necessarily remember everything. And also by the end of the week, there might have been developments during the week that would influence whether he thought something was worth writing down. We actually have a pretty good record, but it's not a perfect record and there are lots of things that are up for grabs. Uh, the United States, I think that under the Articles of Confederation, the states thought of themselves as countries in the same way that countries in Europe think of themselves to greater or lesser degrees as countries. And that's why, for example, you might not give the national government the authority to operate on individuals by taxing or throwing them in jail or whatever. We think of the United States as a nation. 230 years later, there's been a lot of nationalizing impulses. Uh, you know, people, people back in the 1780s, the majority of people spent their entire lives within a 15-mile radius. George Mason, one of the great statespersons of the era apparently had never left Virginia until he went to the Philadelphia Convention at the age of 65. Every American in the law school here, I guarantee, has spent time outside of the state where they were born, and almost all of them have spent time in other countries. So it's just more, you know, it's, it, and, and of course, you know, interstate trade, lots of people were subsistent farmers back then. The United States played no significant international role. The United States was not an international military power. All those changes feed into the idea of having more of a nation, plus we fought this thing called the Civil War that killed 700,000 people to become a nation. Um, it's hard to move from a confederacy to a nation. In the instance of the United States, it led to a civil war that killed, you know, in a nation of 32 million, killed 700,000 people. Uh, Europe is right now experiencing the difficulties in moving in the direction of a nation rather than a confederacy, right? Great Britain wants out. The framers would have said there are always going to be political demagogues out there who are emphasizing your lack of control, that you ought to be afraid, afraid of distant authority. What, Brit, you know, what the Brexiteers said in Great Britain about foreign bureaucrats controlling their lives is exactly what Americans would have said about the Articles of Confederation, Congress trying to raise taxes, raise requisitions. So, over time, it, it, countries may move in that direction, right? The European Union wasn't possible 100 years ago. Instead, everybody was killing each other in two world wars. But even now, having moved in that direction, there's still tremendous resistance, right? Now, the world now is at a moment where uh, nationalism, you know, America first, your country first, it has reached a peak. And, you know, 20, 30 years ago, it looked like we were moving in the other direction, fits and starts. So we probably need to leave the room. I'd, I'd be happy to chat for a few minutes outside. Thanks for coming, everyone. <laughs>